Hello everybody, my name is Ronny, uh, Ronny Hensch. I work for the German Aerospace Center um, close to Munich in Oberpfaffenhofen on machine learning, computer vision for Earth observation data and in particular for, for SAR data. And that's also the topic of the talk today, um, deep learning for synthetic aperture radar or SAR for short. And I want to start with a brief introduction, what is SAR and why it's so exciting and then share a couple of examples how we can use deep learning to analyze or to process SAR imagery. So probably most of you are familiar with optical sensors, um, the cameras in your mobile phones, for example. So those are passive sensors. This means they rely on an uh, external illumination source. Mostly that's the sun. So part of the sunlight is reflected on the surface, on the object or the surface of the earth, and then is reflected towards the sensor that is basically measuring uh, how many photons of a certain wavelength are entering a certain pixel. Um, optical images is, is not the only example, there are also thermal images um, or, um, or radiometers and so on. Now active sensors are a little bit differently. Uh, active sensors do not rely on an external illumination source. Instead they come with their own source of energy. Um, they emit um, an electromagnetic wave, uh, a pulse. This is um, reflected on the surface, part of it is reflected away and part of it is reflected back to the sensor and they are measuring how much of this energy that they send out is, uh, is, is backscattered towards the sensor. Now you can do this with light, then it would be a laser, right? A laser is sending out an uh, um, optical pulse, um, light pulse, and then measuring the energy that is coming back. But you can also do this with other electromagnetic, wa electromagnetic waves, for example, um, um, radio waves or microwaves. And in this case, we are talking about uh, radar. SAR is not the only radar technique, there are others, but in this talk, we may, will mainly focus on, on SAR. So now, what is SAR doing? Well, as I said, SAR is really just a sensor that is mounted on a plane or a satellite. There are also other SAR systems, but this is what we will focus on since we are talking about Earth observation data. And this uh, sensor is sending out a microwave pulse that is scattered on the ground. Part of it is scattered away from the sensor, part of it is maybe absorbed by the medium, and part of it is scattered backwards to the, uh, to the sensor. And the sensor is measuring then how much of this energy that was sent out is, is received again, and also what is the phase of, of this information, uh, of, of this signal. And then we can combine all the echoes of multiple pulses that we have sent out to, to get a full image. So those images nowadays they look a little bit similar to optical images. You see one, one image on the bottom right of this slide. Um, they are a little bit differently though. Uh, we will see some of the effects in, in a minute in the next slides. So this is maybe one of the disadvantages. They are a little bit harder to interpret for humans but also for machines. The big advantage though is that um, they're independent of the sun, right? As an active sensor, you can acquire image data any time of the day, including the night, when an optical sensor is useless. And since we are using microwaves, we're also more robust regarding weather conditions. If there is clouds um, or maybe storm, you know, uh, an, an airplane with an optical sensor can't even fly. Um, even if you have a satellite that is of course going above the clouds, you don't see the ground because it's occluded and so on. For SAR it's not really a problem because you can penetrate cloud, you can penetrate smoke, dust to some extent, maybe even vegetation if you use the right, uh, the, the right frequency of the microwave. The problem though with, with radar imaging is that in order to get a high resolution, and that is what we want because we want to see a lot of details in, in, in the images, right? we want to see small structures and, and uh, small objects, you would need to have a really large antenna. But of course you can't really mount a big antenna on an airplane and you also can't really send a really big antenna into space. It's either not feasible or even if it's feasible it's far too costly. So here SAR is making a really smart trick. It's using a small antenna and then is moving the small antenna um, through space. Since it's bounded on an airplane or a satellite, it's really just the movement of, of this platform. And then all those uh, low resolution images, if you want, um, are combined to a single high resolution image with a really big antenna. Right? Uh, this antenna is synthetic, right? uh, that's why it's called synthetic aperture radar. This technique is actually already quite old. Um, so the first SAR image from space was done more than 50 years ago, nearly 60 years now. Um, nowadays we have a lot of different satellites that are taking much, much better images with higher resolution, with different properties. This list here is not exhaustive. 
And the images that we acquired today look somehow like this. Those are images from the TerraSX sensor, that's a German satellite, um, built together from, from Airbus and, and DLR. And you see here on, on the left-hand side um, a river system with, with mangrove forest. On the right-hand side you see a volcano. And if you wonder what is the circular structure around the volcano, that's a national park where there's a lot of forest. And outside of the national uh, park you have like agricultural fields and, and cities and urban areas and so on. That's why you have this circular structure. Now we also have a lot of airborne uh, sensors, a lot of airborne systems where the SAR sensor is mounted on, on an aircraft. Um, again, this list is not, not complete, but one of the examples is the FSAR sensor that is built up by, by my group at the DLR. This is quite interesting, a quite interesting sensor because we can acquire multiple of those SAR images in different frequencies where each has a little bit of different, uh, different properties. It's uh, fully polarimetric, what that means I will explain in, in a minute. And we have a really high resolution down to a couple of decimeter. So here you see a couple of, of images or visualization of the SAR data. And as you can see, uh, it's quite close to optical images, right? So even if you're not trained for SAR, if you have never seen a SAR image, you can recognize this is uh, agricultural fields, there's roads, uh, buildings, individual trees, and, and so on. But still, in order to really understand all the, the finer details in the SAR image, you need quite some, some expertise. And one of the biggest problems in, in SAR is called speckle. Now, imagine you have multiple small objects in one resolution cell. Resolution cell is an, an area on the ground that is then projected into a single pixel. That might be like rocks, for example, or different plants if you're over a vegetated area and so on. Now, if this uh, if these objects are hit by the microwave, each of them will create their own independent echo. But then all of those echoes are combined and interfere with each other, and then the combined echo is measured uh, by, by the SAR sensor. This is what I try to illustrate here with those blue arrows, right? So this would be the individual um, backscattering signals from the individual objects, but then all of them are combined together and, and, and superimposed. And the final measurement, this is a red arrow, right? So the length of this arrow is the, the amount of energy that, that is measured by the SAR system, and the angle of this arrow would be the phase that, that, of, the, of the wave that we measured. And of course, this is a, a aquatic process. It's not really a random process, because if you would be able to um, create, recreate this image with the exact same conditions, same sensor, same position, nothing on the ground has changed, and so on, then you would exactly get the exact same image back. Right? This is different to, to noise in an optical image. Right? In an optical image, even if I have the camera at the same position, I take exactly the same image, the noise will still be different. Speckle will be the same, but of course we are not really able to get the exact same acquisition parameters. The other thing is, if you just move this slightly, right, um, then the geometric uh, relationship of all those small objects will have changed very, very much, right? Uh, so this means you get a, a very different signal, right? The amplitude will be different and so on. And this is what we see as something that looks like noise in the image. It's not really noise, although a lot of people call it in this way and it's very often modeled like that, but it's this, this random fluctuation in the, the amplitude that we are measuring, right? This, this grainy thing that we have in the image, and this makes it really, really hard for humans to interpret our images but also for, for the machines. And if you look at the face of the signal, right, it looks like here on the right-hand side, uh, it's basically completely random. Uh, it's, as I said, it's not really random, it's a, a, cha a chaotic signal, but there is no information in the face of a single SAR image. Other effects um, are um, foreshortening. Um, since with radar we are measuring distances, not angles. An optical camera would measure an angle, right? So the position where an object is shown on, on, on the image depends on the angle it has to, to the uh, projection center on the object. Now for SAR we are measuring distances. So we send out the pulse and we are measuring the time uh, when this, this echo is recorded again. Um, and depending on this, um, you, know, you, you place this, this information at a certain pixel position. This means that if you have elevated object, like a mountain for example, the top of the mountain, since it's elevated, is already closer to the sensor than uh, a point on the ground. Um, and this means that uh, the, the slope that is facing the sensor will be squeezed together in, in the image, right? And the slope that is facing away from the sensor will be a little bit extended. And if you, um, if you increase the slope, you will come to a point where you not only have um, uh, foreshortening, but layover. So layover means that um, multiple points 
on, on the surface have the same distance to the sensor. And since we are measuring the distance, all of those points will be fused in the same pixel position. So in this example here, the top of the building and the top of a tree and the point on the ground, they will all be in the same, in the same pixel. And you see this also in the image on the right hand side, um, which is again from Terrace X over an urban area with a little bit of cutoff of a, of a 3D model. And you see those high rise buildings um, that are stretching into, into the bay, right? It looks a little bit like we would see the facade that is facing towards us, same as in the, in the 3D model. But actually what is happening is that the sensor is flying on the top of the building, so in the north if you want, and the buildings are falling towards it, so it's actually the other side that is facing away from it, from the facade, that we are observing there. And those are details that are usually quite confusing if you're not, not trained in, in, in SAR images. And the last effect I want to mention is shadow. That is something we also know from optical images. But for optical images, the shadow depends on the position of the illumination source, right? Um, the sun, for example. For SAR images, uh, it only depends on the sensor position, right? So the, the shadow is always on the opposite side of the object where the SAR sensor is. Right? So it's always facing away from the SAR sensor. So this means that for SAR images, there's an inherent orientation. If you show a SAR image to an expert uh, with some elevated um, objects like mountains or high-rise buildings or individual trees if the resolution is high enough, then this person can directly tell you where the, the sensor was flying and in which direction the sensor was looking. Um, there are many different variants for, for SAR. Um, I don't have the time to cover all of them, but one of them I want to um, explain very briefly, that is polarimetric SAR or pulsar for short. Now, SAR is working with electromagnetic waves, right, microwaves, and as any waves, um, this is an, an oscillation, right? So if this is a propagation direction of the wave, the wave is oscillating in all directions, right? Perpendicular to this direct, um, the, the movement of the wave. Now, polarization means that we're restricting this oscillation in, in a certain way. So for example, um, horizon, uh, horizontal polarization means that the wave can only oscillate in, in a horizontal plane. Vertical would mean it only oscillates in a vertical plane. There are other type of polarizations too, uh, but, but those are the ones that are mostly used for SAR. Now what we can do is, when the sensor is emitting the wave, we can, for example, uh, enforce a horizontal um, oscillation or polarization. And then when we are recording the echo, we are only recording the part that is also horizontally uh, polarized. right? Uh, that would be the first image. No? So the HH means it was horizontally polarized during emission and we only measured the part that was horizontally polarized during reception. But then of course you can also measure the other part, right, that is only vertically polarized. That would be HV. And then you can also send out a vertically uh, polarized wave and you can do the same. So this gives us those four, uh, those four different images with slightly different properties. And then we can combine all of them into this false color image. So don't get confused by those colors here. They are arbitrary. They, they are kind of selected in a, in a certain way. Um, it can't be real colors, right? Because we are working with microwaves and not with optical light. But usually we are choosing a coloring scheme that is putting um, forest in, in, in the green area, for example, right? because it looks more natural to us. So just to summarize a little bit about this brief SAR introduction, uh, SAR is an active sensor. This means we are independent of the sunlight. We can take images at any time of the day, also during the night. It's based on microwaves. This means we are more robust to weather conditions. We can look through clouds, through smoke, dust, uh, to some extent through ve vegetation. We can look through ice and sand uh, and snow as long as it's dry um, and so on. Um, it measures very interesting things because the, the echo that we receive, it corresponds to the geometric properties on the ground, but also to dielectric properties and other things um, that we usually don't have in optical sensors. Um, we are measuring the amplitude and the phase. This is really important because this means in every pixel of the star image there is actually a complex valued number that is complicated things because a lot of computer vision algorithms are designed for real valued numbers only. Um, and we can have um, multiple polarizations, and we talk about posar images. We can have uh, multiple images that are taken from slightly different positions, and we are talking about INSAR or differential INSAR or, or tomographic SAR, TOMOSAR. Uh, we can combine those things. For example, then we have pole INSAR, so 
um, the, the two images that are taken from slightly different positions also have different polarizations. Uh, we can have multiple frequencies and so on. And then, well, so SAR images, they are a little bit more complicated than optical images because there are a lot of properties that we don't know, or we are not used to from optical images. Um, it's a complex value signal, I already said that. Uh, it's a distance measure instead of measuring angles, um, which causes like layover and foreshortening. We have um, a sensor depending shadow, right? not, not an illumination depending shadow, and we have the speckle effect. And about the speckle effect, I want to talk more in the second part of this lecture.